This podcast contains adult language and explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Grant. And I'm Erica. And this is From From Crime Crime to to Crime. Hey guys, welcome back to Crime to Crime. If you're just joining us, you are still guys because you guys voted down Crime Dogs. The coolest nickname for a... No, that was the coolest nickname for a fan base. And I'll be honest with you guys, I'm a little upset. You guys are a little irresponsible by voting it down. And you haven't even given us anything better. So what are we, well, what are we working with here? I think they're very responsible for not wanting to be called Crime Dogs. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, cadaver dogs is the next one up. So if anyone has anything better than cadaver oh dogs, God. that's what we're going with. Please vote no. Please vote no. Go to our Instagram from crime to crime and vote cadaver dogs or anything else. Come on. Grant would prefer to just spend every episode researching what we should call you guys instead of the actual case. So I've never had my own fan base before, and I just really want them to have a really cool nickname. Anyway, guys, this week we're going to jump into Kristen Smart. So for our generation, I think this is where the true crime bug really bit us. You know, we had a little taste with Kristen Smart, and then there was a deep dive with our parents and everybody with John Bonet. So I think that these two ninety six is really the golden age for our demographic, the millennial age, to really get into true crime. What do you think? Yeah, this was a big case, especially where we grew up in California. This was everywhere, and now it's everywhere again because of the recent developments. So Grant decided that for the six people who haven't listened to the real podcast about this case, that we should do it. This one's super interesting, and it's super important because of the new developments that have happened. And the podcast that Erica's talking about is In Your Own Backyard, hosted by Chris Lambert. It's a phenomenal deep dive. It's only eight episodes. So if you're really interested in kind of knowing the full amounts deep dive case we highly recommend is it eight episodes i thought it was only six no it's eight episodes oh okay it's eight episodes so definitely definitely go check that out yeah it's a really great podcast and even the sheriff in this case has said that it brought forth witnesses and things they didn't really know about that pretty much solved this case so yeah at this point Kristen smart's case is all but solved officially they they have they do have people in custody but we'll get into that So we'll start off kind of with who Kristen Smart was. She was originally from Stockton, California. At the time, in 1996, she was a freshman at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And on May 25th, 1996, which is Memorial Day weekend, she wanted to party. Her friends and roommates didn't. So they ended up dropping her off at a party near the frat house area. of, Which is never a good idea. Never a good idea. Anyway, fast forward through the end of the night. Kristen's found passed out on a neighbor's lawn at 2 a.m. And luckily she's found by two students, Tim Davis and Cheryl Anderson. And they said, hey, you know what? We're going to get you home. We're going to walk with you. So they start walking and a third student comes up, Paul Flores, who says, hey, like I'm heading that way. I'll help out too. So Tim Anderson lives off campus. He peels off and goes, hey, you know, have a good night, guys. They keep walking. Cheryl gets to her dorm and, you know, goes, hey, Paul, can you take her the rest of the way? Paul is her Cheryl. He'll get her the rest of the way home. No problem. And that ended up being kind of a big problem. We come to find out that she never makes it back to her dorm and she's never seen again after this. When they're walking her too, they've all said in interviews that she couldn't even walk by herself, that she had to have people who had their arms around her and were pretty much walking her. She wasn't walking on her own, which comes into play when Paul says that he'll walk her the rest of the way home. Then when she's never seen again... And they ask him what happened. He's like, well, she, I went to my dorm and she walked to her dorm. It's like she couldn't even walk. Two right. seconds before that, when Cheryl went to her car, she couldn't walk. You're telling me she sobered up enough in two seconds to walk to her dorm herself? Yeah, definitely. And Paul has a reputation about him, too, that you don't want to be left alone with, especially a young, drunk girl. And this is the last person who saw Kristen Smart alive. And her roommate was actually out of town. It was Memorial Day weekend. So she didn't report anything until Monday morning when she got back because they had that Monday off. So Sunday into Monday, so almost a full 48 hours off before anybody is is even looking for Kristen. Which obviously gave whoever did something to her plenty of time to hide things. 
Well, absolutely. And it's not like Kristen not to be in school. So her roommate goes to the campus police and says, my roommate's been gone. Doesn't look like she's been in here since Friday. Her stuff's here, her her wallet, her ID, all the kind of identifying information. And campus police, they just kind of go, eh, she's a college student. It was a, it was a weekend. She probably went away. She'll be back. And everybody always is like, oh, well, you have to give them credit. It was Memorial Weekend. Kids go camping. They do stuff. It's like, yeah, but how many other ones were reported missing that week? Any of them? Yeah. I would understand that excuse if there was 35 and they didn't have time to investigate all of them. But turns out it was just her. Right. And anytime someone goes missing, especially for in a 48 hour window, you need to look for them. <laughs> you need to find them that or at least take it seriously. And I don't understand why police, you know, in any circumstance, don't take missing people's more seriously, even if it does end up that they're found. I know almost every missing person's case starts out that way. It's always like, well, we reported a missing, but the cops said we had to wait 48 hours. No, you don't. You don't have to wait anything. And if they're not doing anything, go to the next place. Go to the next agency. Go to the real cops. You don't have Absolutely. to deal with campus police. Absolutely. And so she's gone for these few days. So it wasn't until the following month that the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office took over from Cal Poly. And they didn't do a whole lot better with than, no. than the Cal Poly police did. It is really sad how often you hear about the police not taking it seriously. But I guess it's these stories that we learn that from. That we learned that you don't have to wait, that you do you do have to be pushy sometimes. And ugh. Yeah. yeah, if someone you know went missing, I would definitely want them to start looking a lot sooner than later. Even though, you know, the, the sheriff's office did kind of drop the ball, they did do a, a pretty thorough search at the beginning of the campus. They went on horseback. They had helicopters. They had people canvassing the areas. They, they went through the dorm rooms. They even brought in cadaver dogs to the nah. dorms to search search everything what is your aunt oh i thought you were gonna make a cadaver dogs joke and i was like just oh. let it go cadaver dogs is a great fan base nickname for anyone out there wondering but i overreacted they- when you hadn't even said it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it before i got there but I, yeah what, what was really interesting about the cadaver dogs was that when they were brought into the dorm they weren't alerted anywhere at all except paul flores's room allegedly what do you mean allegedly that we know that we know that we know that those dogs were <laughs> let off in his room. But the thing was, is that it waited so long. And it was at the end of the semester. Paul had cleaned his room. Most most of the kids had cleaned their rooms out there. They had already come through with the janitorial Janitors. services. Yeah, yeah. The janitorial services that had come through and cleaned these things. And yet the dogs were still alerted and only to this room. Hmm. Big red flag that left un- untouched by by investigators. And just in case we're not being clear, this podcast is going to be very biased because even before this arrest, we were 100 percent sure who did this crime. Yeah, we, so. yeah it, it's true. We, we're not we're not pulling any punches here. Yeah, we are going to say allegedly because we don't want to be sued, but that's only because he hasn't been convicted yet. But imagine that the only place that they picked up a scent was in the one guy's room that <laughs> that saw our missing last. So mm-hmm. obviously he's identified as a person of interest very early on in the case, even though he's denied having any involvement. He says he went to his dorm. She went to hers. They were, they were separated. Yeah. But she, she all of a sudden sobered up quick enough to walk to her own dorm room. One of the, uh, the other things too, is the day after that Kristen went missing, people saw Paul and he had a black eye. Well, there's a mugshot. There's a mugshot of him with a black eye from two days after she went missing when he got arrested for a DUI. And he conveniently, you know, leaves that out on telling police what happened. He doesn't tell them he doesn't want to tell them, you know, what happened. Well, he makes up different stories and different Absolutely. things. But the biggest theory is that obviously Kristen gave it to him fighting back for her life. But I have a whole other theory on how I think he got the black eye. Theories are at the end of the podcast and we'll get into it. You're right. So police bring in horseback they bring in helicopters they bring in cadaver dogs great name for a true crime fan base missing persons posters and billboards rewards are being starting to be put up all along the roads and the highways police start talking to kristen's acquaintances and they're like hey what do you think might have happened and what happened was they got the story they got that she was dropped off at an unofficial fraternity house is is the term that they use and i don't know necessarily that it makes it a, a big difference if it's official or unofficial Maybe it does to the chapter. I don't know the difference, but neither one are a place where you should ever be alone drunk. Right. Absolutely. But again, you know, everything kind of comes back to the last person who saw her for sure was Paul Flores. He He's saying, oh, I didn't do it. I let her go and I kept walking. And 
No one believes him. Even police who did kind of drop the ball on this, not even they're believing him. Even when they're questioning him, they're telling him, look, we don't know that you did it, but we know you know what happened. And yeah. he's he's not giving anything to him. Yep. Well, and then the Smart family filed a, lo- a wrongful death lawsuit against him in 97 because the police hadn't arrested him yet. And he still wasn't charged, but he didn't answer any questions during the whole deposition. Every single question, he cited the Fifth Amendment. They have the audio of that. And it is just him over and over and over again saying, my lawyers have advised me not to answer that question in invoking the fifth amendment. And so he answers yeah. nothing and he, and it really, it really gets nowhere. But his uh, mom and his dad answer a lot of questions. Well, his mom and his dad do answer a lot of questions and his dad is such a jerk about the whole thing and plays oh, dumb. An uh, yeah. Really both of his parents are huge reasons why this has gone on as long as, it, as they have, they know more than they're willing to tell. Allegedly. Allegedly, but they're not opening their mouths. And that's that's a big part of the problem, if not even the biggest problem, is it's alleged that they know what's going on and they won't say anything. In our opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they have a reputation for suing people because they sued the Smart family back. They countersued the Smart family. The family of a missing girl who are looking for their daughter and your son was the last one seen with her. They sued them. Absolutely. And they're wrong for it. The reason they're saying it is because they feel like they're being targeted and they're being harassed and all these yeah. things because they should be because they <laughs> allegedly know what's happened to their missing daughter. So in our opinion, in our opinion, it's not uh, it's not a super, super big surprise that that they're getting harassed. Yeah, of course because not. They know things and everyone knows that they know things. Yeah. To make matters even worse, it's believed that Kristen Smart was taken to some of the Flores' homes, whether it was Ruben's or Susan's, it's kind of been up for debate. So a little bit about Paul's parents, just to, because that's where this is headed. They were divorced at the time that this happened and living separately. Like Susan owned her own house and Ruben owned his own house. So in the rest of the episode, when we talk about Susan's house or Susan's rental property or Ruben's house, it's two separate things. They're not married. Absolutely. And Susan ended up buying a second house as a rental property. Mm-hmm. That pay, plays a big part into this story too, because she ends up renting the house out to Mary Lassiter and her family. And while they live there, Mary describes hearing a watch that would go off every single morning in the garden around 4 20 AM. Like the beep on a, on an alarm, like on an old school nineties watch, they used to have like the alarms that beeped and she what? swears she heard that beeping. Well, and she says, swears that she heard it for months, and it would go off early in the morning around 4.20 a.m., and for the life of her, she could not find it. She says that she dug through the planners, dug through everything trying to find it, and then it just finally stopped. She didn't really think much of it until things started you know, kind of coming around about lawsuits in the mail and whatnot, and she started asking Susan, like, hey, what, what's going on with this? Well, and she and, started getting postcards from people exactly. saying – Tell your son to tell the truth, and and she was like, "My son's a child." Like, yeah, he's like nine years about? old. And then exactly. she realized they were to Susan Flores, not her. So this does kind of spark something in in Mary, and eventually she does tell Kristen Smart's mom about what's going on, and she Kristen Smart's mom gave her a little bit of insight, really interesting stuff that Kristen was new to being a lifeguard at the university, and when you're new, you have the early morning shift. Her shift started at 5 a.m., so it would make sense that she would have an alarm set on her phone for 420 to wake herself up, get ready, and get out the door to an on-campus shift at 5 a.m. Yeah, and Mary Lasser found other things while they were living in the rental home, like she found an earring in the driveway that I've heard her describe the earring as matching the necklace that Kristen Smart has been seen wearing in pictures. I've heard that too, and police came around and were and were talking to Mary and her family while they were there. And her husband gave the investigator the earring because he was like, "This sounds like something you might need for your investigation. Here, hopefully, this can help." And the Smart family never knew about it. Well, and then the police lost it. So right, so they don't know where it is. Mary went and bought a replica of of a very ma- similar matching earring so that she had it to kind of reference. But the actual earring itself has been missing so the smart family declared Kristen legally dead in 2002 but this case has never been considered a cold case and the way a cold case is 
described as a case that no new developments or leads are found to, to follow. And they have still found lots of evidence and leads, so they're still following it. So it's not a cold case. It's just it's just an old case at this point. Just a bumbled case. It's definitely a, a mumbled, bumbled, jumbled case. Yeah, all there was it. a lot of mistakes made in the first two sheriffs that had this case. So in 2004, the family collected donations to keep billboards going up along Highway 101 to maintain awareness of the case in the area and and the greater Los Angeles area as well, since that's the biggest city to them. The sheriff's investigators, they've used forensic specialists assigned to the case. They've used 18 different search warrants. They've submitted 37 items that were collected in the early days of the case for DNA, the early case for DNA testing. They've recovered 140 items of new evidence and conducted 91 interviews from 2011 to 2020. So obviously there's still a lot going on in this case. The the officers have not given up. And when we say that there was a lot of stuff jumbled and fumbled, the first two sheriffs that were a part of this case really mishandled a lot of different things. And, And, you know, there were leads that were left. There was evidence that just went missing. This case very well may have, could have been solved much earlier, but the sheriff that's in now, Ian Parkinson, he was actually an investigator on this case. So this one is very important to him. And he's, and he's made note of that. And he said that, you know what, there may have been mistakes that have been made before I came. There have been mistakes made since I've been here, but it seems like his ultimate goal is to be the sheriff responsible for finding Kristen Smart's body. Well, it's probably because he saw the mistakes that were made from his predecessors while he was investigating it. And he was like, oh, gosh, we should have solved this. Well, there was a lot of mistakes made, too, but there was a lot of stuff dropped because the FBI had some pieces of evidence. The sheriff's department had some pieces of evidence, but the two departments didn't talk to each other well enough to realize what each other had. So lots of stuff was left out. It's a pissing contest. Yeah. This sheriff wants to be the one that solves it and he doesn't want a sharing of his information with this sheriff or with the FBI because he wants to be the one that takes credit for. So it's like, can we just get the case solved? Nobody's going to remember your name unless you screw this up. Remember, though, being the sheriff is a political position. So it makes sense that these guys would want to be the ones to solve it and keep that info because that's going to help their political career down the line. And it shouldn't matter. And I agree with you on that. But I think that's something to keep in mind that. The, that there's more to it than just solving this. And is that right? No. But is it true? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so things started to heat up on February 5th when Paul Flores' home in San Pedro was searched. Authorities removed computers and other electronic devices. And the thought is, is they removed those things because of the podcast and uh, and people talking about this again and the family everyone involved started using these devices. The thought is that they may have been using these devices to communicate to each other. And I think it's pretty safe to say the police did find something because on March 16th, Sheriff Ian Parkinson was able to serve a warrant to Paul's father, Ruben Flores' home in Arroyo Grande. We were told that the search could take up to a few days and it did. Officials say that they were using cadaver dogs, which is another great name for a podcast game base. And ground pa- ground penetrating radar devices, GPR, over the course of the search. And what the GPR does is it sends radars down to the ground and sees what comes back up to see if there may be skeletal remains in the ground. It can't detect remains. It detects an- anomalies in the dirt. Oh, okay. Just saying yeah no the anomalies only show when dirt's been disturbed okay perfect so that's what that's what gpr is used for it 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 detects when dirt's been disturbed and then they have to test that disturbed dirt and go oh shit there's a body here or oh shit there was a body here and police because it's an ongoing investigation can't really speak about what exactly they're finding and what they're looking for but tony sapala a spokesperson for the sheriff's office said that, that they recovered some items of interest in the case and they are following up on leads tips and good and get investigative work so they're letting us know that they're they're finding something you know yeah there's something there they they do say it's not specific- Kristen though it's not Kristen they say specifically they have not found a body of Kristen smart but they did find other things that may lead to possibly finding that mm. so on April 13th they arrested Paul Flores and his father Ruben who's now 80 years old and they arrested Paul for murder and they arrested Ruben for accessory so they found something they definitely I mean they definitely found something this is a 24 year old murder investigation and they finally arrested somebody 
on murder charges. Yeah, they definitely yeah, they found, found something. something. Yeah. I don't think it's the body though. Obvi- well, the police told us it's not the body, but I definitely think that they found something that is incriminating enough to make it's this arrest finally. Absolutely. Well, and then we found out later they put a gag order in to the lawyers, the defendants, the prosecution, everybody. They're not supposed to talk about the case. But somehow documents were released saying that prosecutors think that the body was under Ruben Flores' back deck in his backyard and that it was recently moved. And I think that it's probably been moved more than just once or twice. I think they've moved it a handful of times. Yeah. Anyway, as it sits right now, Ruben Flores is out on bail. The judge in the case lowered his bail from $250,000 to $50,000. So he posted bail, got out. They put on a ankle monitor on him. They took away his passport, and he has to stay in the San San Luis Obispo County lines. Yeah, and Susan was the one who posted his bail. So that's another interesting point, too, because they are divorced. They're not They've been divorced this whole time. Right. They've been divorced this entire time, but they still watch out for each other, almost like there's a secret that they're protecting. Almost like they're covering up for something. Right, the family Almost like she's going to bail him out of jail and go physically pick... She went and physically picked him up from jail. If police are not watching the Flores family right now while both of them are out and about... They they have have to be. be. They have to be. There has to be some kind of surveillance on them in some capacity because... Because it's like, my parents are divorced and they're nice to each other and they talk to each other, but there's no way in hell my mom's bailing my dad out of jail if he gets arrested. No way. I... I could. Why I could did she? And she went and picked him up. Why doesn't one of his family members or friends or his daughter come and get him? Why is Susan getting him? Is she afraid he's going to say something? Well, that's part of it, too, is Ruben Flores doesn't have any family in the areas. And that's why another peculiar thing that they've stayed in the area that make people think that they're hiding something because. They've been scrutinized left and right for this kind of thing. And people oh. totally believe that Paul did it because he did, allegedly. Oh, and harassing them and putting exactly. up billboards everywhere. And yeah. Why would you stay in that area unless you had something to hide? Like, they're protecting the property that they're on. There's something there for whatever reason that they're – it's not because they love this area. Ruben has no family in this place. They're not doing it because well, it's just such a Well, and their kids both nice moved area. to Southern California. Absolutely. It's not because that there's some, something so nice. There's something that they're hiding and they're Yeah, protecting their lives them. are miserable there. They should have left a long time ago. Yeah, because they're constantly harassed by people who, you know, and not only by people, by billboards and by other, you know, flyers and whatnot. This hasn't gone away. If you're innocent, you would have left this because you can stand to be a part of it. But that's the thing is their whole family, everybody involved with this left except Ruben and Susan. Now, the only reason you wouldn't leave is if there was a body in your backyard. And what a terrible person Paul is to keep his parents hostage in this area that he caused the problem. The reason they're hostage here is because of him. And he moved down to San Pedro, which is... Do you think it's him? Three. That's interesting. That's your view? You think it's him? What do you mean? Oh, I don't think Paul's smart enough to do any of this. I think this oh, is I, Ruben and Susan not letting. I think if it was Paul, he probably would have admitted to it the day after he did it. Oh, so you think that Paul? I think and, it's and, Ruben and Susan that won't let him admit to it. Do you think that that Ruben and Susan kicked him down to like out of the area mm-hmm. to make it easier on him? Yep, because I think they knew he would snap if he was up there still. I, and I guess you know, parents are willing to do whatever it takes to keep their kids out of jail. But my goodness, I'm sorry, I. That whole thing where it's like, oh, mother will do anything. It's like Kristen Smart's mother is missing her daughter. You don't have any sympathy for her about what your son did. Clearly not because. And not only do they not and they're like not just trying to protect their kid. They're assholes about it. Very much so. And and it only makes you dislike them more because of how smug they are about it. They know what happened. They know where Kristen Smart's body is. In our opinion. In our opinion, but they're not willing to tell investigators or, you know, send them up the creek. Everyone's life would have been moved on. There's a good chance that Paul would have already been out of jail and, you know, continuing his life. Well, and there's a good chance that he wouldn't have hurt all these other women that he's supposedly raped since then. Well, that's a whole other podcast that <laughs> we don't have time to get into right now. No, we don't, but we should because Susan and Ruben should be in jail just for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because. There was a whole issue with that that they were sued over of that too. And when when questioned about it, Ruben kind of plays dumb. Like I don't know what you're talking about. Like yeah, you do. That's the reason you guys moved up there to begin with. 
because they were originally from. Oh, but that had nothing to do with his rapes. No, that was when he beat that kid in Torrance. That's right. And stomped on his head. And that's, right. we, that's why they had to move out of Torrance was because Paul was a nightmare as a child. That's right. Like yeah. this kid's been a nightmare forever. And instead yeah. of getting him help and anger management and things that you can do as a parent to help troubled kids like this, they were just irresponsible and they did none of it. And they just covered yeah. up for him every time. They he did exacerbated wrong. the problem. Right. They exacerbated the problem and they helped turn him into who he is today. So. Erica, I know you have some theories onto this, so let's th- take a deep dive into theory land. What do you have? What What do well, you? Well, there's think? really, I mean, there's not. There's obviously little spin-off theories that you could go on each one, but really, the only theory is that Paul tried to rape her and it didn't go well, and his parents helped him cover it up. I mean, I don't see any other. In my opinion, I don't see any other theories where this went any other way. The only theory that I do think. A lot of people think that he got the black eye that he had in his DUI arrest was from Kristen fighting back. And I I think it could be from when he called his dad to help him move a body. His dad was like, you dumb motherfucker. And probably punched him. I definitely think that theory could be be true. I mean, as a father myself, it, no, I take that out. I'm going to say I'm going to punch Cyrus. No, no. <laughs> and, and you're not going to cover up for your kid either. So No, I wouldn't do that either. But No, but I just think that, you know, maybe they were like, Ugh. like, I just feel like they knew at some point with all of his problems, they knew he was going to do something like this and they did nothing about it. And then when it did happen, they covered it up. When he- Anytime he had done anything in the past, they had done everything they could to cover it up and make things right. And this is just something that they shouldn't have touched. I mean, it's just, it's too much. It's too over it's, your head. Yeah. And I don't think Susan Flores knew at the beginning what happened. I think when, you know, Paul started being accused, she probably said what happened. But I think Paul went to his dad first, foremost. And for a while, it was just between them. I think she knows now what happened, but I'm not sold that she knew off the bat initially of what happened. You don't think so? Not off the bat. I think eventually I she. I think she, uh, I think she's the one he called. You think so? Mm-hmm. And I think she made Ruben help him. Mm, see, I think I think he Allegedly, called dad first. In my opinion, <laughs> I think I think he called his dad first and said, "Oh my gosh, dad! You know this was an accident." I don't think because I don't think he initially meant to kill Kristen. I think he was looking for a good time and he took it very too far. And she no, I don't think this a was good... a looking for a good time and he took it too far. I think Paul's a gross rapist and she fought back. He fucking was gross and he did this all the time. It wasn't like an out of character for him one time thing. He did this all the time. I don't think he killed people all the time, but I think he did this to women all the time. This was his MO to like just yeah. pounce on them when they were drunk. Yeah, I can mm-hmm. see that. Yeah. He's just, a, I, he's a gross person and yeah, the, and, and all the theories with the body. Now the paperwork coming out that the prosecutors think the body was moved after the recent searches for me listening to that. I think the bodies have been moved a lot over the years. I think every time they search Ruben's house after they're done searching, they move the body from Susan's to Ruben's and then they search Susan's house. They don't find anything and they move the body back. Like, I really think they've been doing that. For 20 years. I think so, too. I, I And that's why I think now Susan knows, but I don't think she knew to begin with. But I think now she definitely knows. I mean, I don't, I don't think you could keep it. If, she, if you don't think she knew in the beginning, how do you explain the beeping watch in her backyard right after the disappearance? Well, that's the thing is, I th- well, no, I'm not saying that she, it wasn't there. I just don't think that she knew about it actively. Mm. But I I definitely think Kristen Smart's body was at that house. I 100% think So that. you think Paul and Ruben did it without her knowing? I do because they were doing a lot of work in her backyard. They're the ones who were breaking the concrete in the backyard to put new planter beds in and things like mm. that. So, yeah, I think that Susan I think they were house. only doing that once they had a body to hide. I don't think they were doing that to put new planters in her backyard. I think it all was very simultaneous. I think they were working mm. in the backyard and because of that, that's where they took the body first because they had the broken concrete. They had, you know, a, so, a place to put these things. To argue my own theory, if they had moved it back and forth a bunch of times over the years, why wouldn't they just get rid of it? Because then they weren't able to control where it was, who found it, anything like that. If they put mm-hmm. it on their own property yeah. and down a ways or under something, then they're able to monitor that and keep an eye on it 100% of the time. 
Yeah. Without, yeah, okay. you know, worrying like, oh, yeah. Because yeah, I've, I've thought about that a lot. I'm like, why would they move it? If the, if the police have searched your backyard 18 times and they've never found her body, why move it now? I think, well, I think that's why they keep moving it, because I think every time the police come, I think that they've already moved the body. At this point, I don't think the body's on one of their properties. I think the body is somewhere in an undisclosed location, maybe one that they have ownership of or access to, something where there's probably yeah. still well, some kind. Well, you mentioned earlier they better be tailing Ruben now that they decided to let a murderer out of prison. That's exactly what I'm saying is I think that it may be in an undisclosed location now, but I, and I do think we're going to find out. I think, I think Paul Flores is going to crack eventually. He's, he's denying oh, it now I think and so. saying, yeah, I think that it's too much. It's been far too long. And so I think that, yeah, he's, I gonna... can't believe with his drinking problems and his drug issues and all that over the years, allegedly, I can't believe he hasn't already cracked and told anybody, you know, he got close a, a couple times. I remember t- hearing a, an interview with an yeah, ex girlfriend of his. Yeah. Yeah. And she said that he would get drunk and say, like, I've got to tell you something. I've got to tell you something. And right. never came out and said what it was. But I'm sure this is eating them alive. And I would imagine that when Paul does tell that he, he did it, it's going to be a huge weight and burden lifting off of him. And, you know, for his family, too, to just have this secret out. I don't know. I think they're all psychopaths. I don't think it's going to matter to them either way. Oh, I think that. Do you think they're ever going to arrest Susan? I think eventually they will, yeah. I think that once more evidence comes to light, I think maybe once they find the body, I think then that's when they'll go after Susan. But like I said, I think at the beginning she didn't know about this. And so now that they're just finding the body, I think they're just starting to tip, get a tip of the iceberg of really what happened. So if yeah. if there's still a body there, which I assume that there is somewhere, I think that eventually she'll go down with the ship. I hope so because – in my opinion, what her and Ruben have done since this happened has been just as bad as what happened. I think so, too. Because like they're it's exacerbating so the whole situation. Right. It didn't need to be this long. And, you know, the Smart family deserves some answers. Some rest. Yeah, they've been going about this way too long. They deserve some answers. They deserve some rest and some ability to, to move on past this. Yeah, and you're never going to move on from something like this, but they deserve to know what happened to their daughter. Some closure. Absolutely. They deserve to know what happened, you know, and that the person responsible is facing as close to justice as you can get for something like this, because true justice would mean that Kristen was alive today walking with us. And that's just not going to happen. So it won't be true justice, but it will be as close to it as we can. Well, get and it won't be true case. justice because the state of California won't put anybody to death. So, well, again, we don't believe in the death penalty on all on all accounts here at from crime to crime so that's okay i'd be only your half more happy. yeah well part of us part of us don't agree with it <laughs> and i'm much more uh, i would much rather see him sitting in prison for the rest of his life which which is what happens in california anyway even when somebody gets the death penalty so he'll be, yeah he's gonna be in jail for th- which i don't think paul would last 10 fucking minutes in prison so there'll be prison justice before there's ever an execution in california anyway uh, yeah i kind of figured he'd go down one way or the other yeah so yeah I actually think he's probably safer in prison than he is out of prison. I could see that for sure. Because in prison, they're going to put him in. They're going to keep him safe. Yeah, they're going to put him because they don't want. Custody. It's not like back in the day where we used to just like let people kill Jeffrey Dahmer and stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah. The, if they, if that happens now, somebody's getting sued. We could go into theories on this case for hours and days on what happened, who was there, who wasn't, all that kind of stuff, but. I think we did a pretty good job of giving the the brief overview of the case, which there's so much that goes into this. And that's why we really highly recommend your own backyard for a deeper dive into this, because you really will understand what happened to it or what you really will understand what happened to Kristen smart and why the police department really has taken such a long time to do what was so obvious in front of their faces, allegedly in our opinion, in our opinion. So Erica, any closing thoughts before we let these cadaver dogs go? No, we're not doing that. All right, cadaver dogs. Go to our Instagram, From Crime to Crime, or send us an email at fromcriminalcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Bye, guys. Bye, bub. Love you. Love you, too.